Judith Owen, singer extraordinaire, welcome to Cultural Attaché. I am so happy to be doing this with you, my attaché friend. Well, I'm 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 happy that we get to talk about you know your music, which you know your album "Come On and Get It," you know it is out in a deluxe edition. And amongst the people whose songs you record on that is Peggy Lee, who wrote the music for "Lady and the Tramp," and you sing "He's a Tramp" on the album. And yes. Peggy Lee said something that made me think of of what I know about you and your career. She said, "I try to project not only a song but a personality." Now the album is released under the name Judith Owen, but on stage, you're Lady J. How much do the <laughs> songs that you choose to record and perform reflect Judith Owen, and how much is a preparation for who Lady J is when she performs them? Um, a very good question, actually. But the truth is, it's all Judith Owen. Lady J. Um, I was christened Lady J by my trumpet player um kevin lewis's mother who when we when i did the first ever show at snug harbor in new orleans um right after recording this i mean it was the last day of recording it and she jumped out of the seat after i'd finished singing king size papa good I, that's all you can do after you sung that and she screamed we love you lady J," and the whole place cheered when you know they, they were it was amazing and so they've been my band and everyone else has been calling me that lady J ever since i think what it refers to is um, the, the the unapologetic badass woman that I've been gestating, you know, has been hiding inside. I've always been, you know, uh, a, a power, powerful woman at the piano. That's what I always wanted to be. Thanks to these women um, who, who this album celebrates, starting with with Nellie Larcher, Julia Lee, of course, Peggy Lee. Um, and it's, oh, it's always been about um, finding a, a place, a vehicle, a platform, a stage where I could show all these aspects of myself unapologetically because, you know, this is an industry, as, as Craig, I know you understand, that doesn't, that likes to pigeonhole, that likes to keep you one in one lane. And that's not who I am. It's not who these women were. And I am right now bringing everything I've ever learned and that, I guess that's who Lady J is. That's why it makes me smile. But it is all me. I'm bringing it all. I, I, I always wanted to be the consummate entertainer. I wanted to sing and perform and dance and play the piano and and uh, and have that stagecraft. Um, and I do believe that for me, I can't do anything that I don't I don't do from within. So whether it's my songwriting or whether it's me covering somebody else, like doing a jazz version of Black Hole Sun by Soundgarden, which is some, one of those things I love to do, or I the Tiger, or whether it's me up on stage singing these delicious risque songs of these marvelous women. Um, I, you, have to, you have to inhabit it. Peggy Lee was absolutely correct. You have to be, you have to wrap it around you like a beautiful piece of clothing. Um, and that's why in terms of uh, He's a Tramp, which we know is, you know, the Disney classic with two dogs eating, sharing spaghetti. Um, I take it somewhere entirely personal to me. I take it somewhere. I take it to church. I take it new, to New Orleans. I take it somewhere very sexual and adult about being in love with with somebody who's just, you know, is basically a player, a bad guy. We've all done that. And uh, how it feels to not really care anymore because that experience is uh, is is worth the journey. And so, yeah, I'm I'm a I'm a big Peggy Lee lover for many reasons. Her control, her ultimate uh, um, ability to to steer every aspect of her career, um, even down to the way she started. You know, the reason why she sings so quietly, or you know, the reason she had that husky, soft voice is because she was so sick of singing over or trying to compete with drunken brawlers. Uh, at any venue that she was playing at, that she she just get to, got quieter and softer and softer until it came down and suddenly everybody was embarrassed to make a noise. And then you heard Peggy Lee. And that's what I call a woman in control. So long answer to a very, very short question, my love. But the truth is, that's all me. And it's all me finally on display, unapologetically. Judith Owen, Lady J, whatever you want to call me, it's me. Well, and there is a tradition of that. I mean, there is a difference between the Divine Miss M and Bette Midler. Yeah. 
yeah, those are, that's absolutely they amazing. may be two parts, you know, of the same person, but they are flip sides of, of that person's coin. They it. absolutely are. And <laughs> funnily enough, I've had more comparisons recently, especially in Europe, of all places, uh, to the divine uh, Bette Midler. And, and I know why. And, and I take it as the biggest uh, um, compliment there ever could be, because she is another woman who could not be pinned down, refused to be pinned down. Um, brilliant musician, brilliant singer, brilliant uh, uh, performer, dancer, entertainer. There it is again. There's the word entertainer um, and funny as hell, you know, and unafraid of being funny as hell. You know, you go through life as a woman. And I can't speak to how men, are, uh, how this is dealt with men. I know it's very different. I, I'm absolutely sure it's very different. I've seen it myself. Um, there is such a um, inequity between women who uh, want to do more than one thing and be more than decoration still to this day. And one of those kind of almost verboten, scary areas is to be a funny woman and to be good looking and to be masterful at what you do and to be a great musician and a, a, a entertainer, but also to be a serious performer and serious artist, as well as being funny. Somehow it's it's almost as if you can't do that. You can't do all of that. You can't you can't be taken seriously and be somebody who is witty and charming and funny as heck on stage too. It's ridiculous how um, how we we just we we minimize this and and I I believe that this is what being uh, it's almost a lost art I suppose but it, it, the idea of being an all round entertainer you know it's almost like nobody wants to actually say that anymore but it is. Um, it's a rare thing that you see. And I think the last person that really did do this was Bette Midler. And I'm proud to be put in that category. If there is a category, let put me in the Bette Midler category, please. Right now, Come On and Get It features a lot of songs that, that you know, you've alluded to that have a lot of innuendo built into yeah. them. You know, and you talk about how these women own the songs. It's interesting. I looked at most of the song credits and most of the songs are written by men. Yeah. Which is which is which is interesting. Do you think men men songwriters had a better understanding of how to express this innuendo for a woman than perhaps? Well, I would I would now? I would question I'd question you on that. Um, I would I would I would say that's not quite true. I mean, he's a tramp. Is written by Peggy Lee. Julia Lee's most of Julia Lee's songs are written by herself. She wrote. Um, Fine Brown Frame, Nelly Lutcher. That's different. That's a written by men. But Nelly Lutcher wrote Real Gone Guy. She wrote many of her hits, so I, 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 that's not actually correct. Well, you do have um, a Harold Arlen song on on your album, which yes, I think I would, su which would surprise people because people assume Harold Arlen is is the quiet, demure man who could who could co-write somewhere over the rainbow. Correct, but then when you hear "Everything I Got Belongs to You," um, and when you know that that's been, you know, some of it, it, the thing that I wanted to do is I wanted to. And of course, the Dinah Washington songs, of course, you know, not only are they written by men, but arranged by Quincy Jones, for God's sake. So, you know, that's going to be killing. But what these women were all about, whether they wrote it or not, it was about their ownership of it. It was about the fact that they could sing it and deliver it in a way that no one else could. No man would ever would ever get away with this or do this and be that empowered. I mean, this was an era where women were meant to be decoration. Nice girls were singing about romance, for God's sake. These women were not only singing about sex, they were celebrating female sexuality and enjoying it. And they had a smirk on their faces. They had their tongues in their cheeks and they were putting it out there that they were women in control of themselves, their bodies, their sexualities, of the job that they were doing, the stage that they owned and the men that played for them. This was something else. I mean, if people think that, you know, that sexuality has only just occurred with Megan Thee Stallion and uh, Cardi B. Think again, ladies. Think again, ladies and gentlemen. These women were in control and sexy, out of control sexy, and they didn't even take it off. So let's just talk about that. And I think that it's it's very much, um, to me, I, call, I, I say that what these women did and what I'm doing and bringing my fresh take on this, my voice, my musicality, my own uh, musicianship and my, and my own sensibilities as, as a writer too, and an interpreter. Um, is that I'm realizing and showing uh, the joy and, and the sexiness of keeping it on, 
keeping it on and delivering songs like Everything I've Got, which, which honestly is one of those witty, amazing songs that makes me smile because it's so cruel, it's so clever, it's so full of, of acerbic wit. I adore it. And it's just, um, I call it an exercise in female confidence self-confidence and empowerment and I think that's what all these songs and these women stood for they were a bottle of joy they were a bottle of joy their lives were so hard it was so tough it was so difficult even for your Peggy Lees your Julie Londons of course your Blossom Dearies um it was hard they it was hard to be seen to be respected uh even if your Blossom and your beloved by Bill Evans and Miles Davis, she was still the cult figure because it, it was that thing of like, how, 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 what do you do? I mean, apart from the, you know, the, the, the five, six verve classics, they're now classics, but what to do with a woman that looked like a librarian, sounded like a sex kitten and played like an absolute killer. And that's the point. And, but the charm of these women, the strength, the incredible truth of these women is that, and I'm here to say this with this record. That's what I want to do. Um, they were, they're classics and they're women that opened the door to women like me. It's because of them, literally in my case, because of them, because they're the first women that I heard and the light bulb went on and I realized, actually, I could be this. That's who I want. That's who was what was already inside me. And these women were giving me permission and the map to be that kind of woman, that kind of performer and musician. It's the harder road, it's the longer road. You don't hit the giant stardom, Peggy did. Um, and she she struggled, she had her own struggles. Uh, but honestly, it's it's the one that, that at the end of the day, uh, uh, without sounding too cliched, you can look at yourself and, and, and feel proud of who you are and what you do. And when you're on stage, let me tell you, there's nothing like it. Well, I would have to assume singing these songs on stage is a, allows you to to bring everything that you that you know. Recording studio can accomplish a lot, but yeah. your live performance, which I had the pleasure of seeing in May, you know, allows you to bring that much more. I mean, you you are able to really sell these songs in a way that just listening to them could not, right? No, no, that's correct. And I and I'm I'm a very visual um, artist. Uh, performing is my love, is my true love. Live performance is, is what I, I live for. Uh, everything is recorded live, it's one take. And, and I believe in that completely and utterly um, uh, because I want to keep that, I want, I want to keep that seat of the pants feeling that makes great performance, you know? It's just like, I'm not a drop in, try this again, 30 takes, you know, I believe, I'm, I'm the, the, the school of, of Frank Sinatra myself, that's what I believe in. But um, live, it's as if one is incomplete without the other. That's how I've always seen it. I think that the album and the music is something you want to go home with. It's something that makes sense. And I'm very proud of that album. And, and I swear so many people, I'm amazed that I've got like 2 million streams. I can't believe it. It's, it's extraordinary. But the thing that I love about performing it live is, again, my job is to entertain you, but also to transport you and to leave you breathless with, with that art form that isn't rarely seen these days. And that is that sort of, it's it's an old art form and it's a wonderful art form. So I am like a stand up on stage. I'm a stand up singer, songwriter, interpreter, lady, whatever you want to call me, lady, whoever I am. And I think that I, I, I just want people to go home feeling like they've seen, they were there for something special, that they've seen something that, that they won't see again. And, and that you rarely see. I want people to have that joy to, to be lifted up by me. I did this record because I was so depressed during COVID. I mean, these, these are a group of women who've literally changed my life twice. Twice as a kid, in my darkness, in my, in, in, in my sadness, and as an adult in COVID where it all came back. That sadness came back and they came and there they were again. And I knew that the best way to come out of, of darkness and of that situation for everybody, for me, for my audience, for the listeners, for everybody, was something that brought such joy, such distraction, such, such hopefulness. And that's what that's what it's truly all about. So as far as I'm concerned, if I if I could spend the rest of my life 
on stage performing like this um that, that's really what i've always wanted that's always what i've what i've wanted now we've we've talked about we've talked about you know a range of peggy lee and blossom deary and dinah washington to cardi b and megan the stallion <laughs> but i think there's somebody we're forgetting in between who also you know you have recorded and that would be donna summer who when she first oh. when she first released love to love you baby with the simulated sounds of orgasms in it it was hugely controversial i mean I, I, re I remember this controversy and i'm just sort of thinking get over it um yeah. do you but female self-expression and ownership has changed a lot from the time of the music that you've recorded to what's being released as new music today where do you think female self-expression will go vis-a-vis -vis artists in the next 10 or 15 years well um like i said it's um i'm 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 a i believe that you do um what makes you feel good i'm somebody that believes in in finding your authentic voice and your authentic being I could no more, you know, get on stage, um, whatever age I was, uh, uh, you know, and dress like Cardi B or Megan Thee Stallion. I call myself Judith the Pit Pony because I'm from Wales, so that makes more sense. Um, but I could no more do that, you know, than than you know, um, fly in the air. It's just not my thing. And and uh, and I do feel that it's important to to you know, I I, I do feel that. Because I have so many young women now reaching out to me, which is incredible to think of myself as a role model when I was I've been so lost, of course, myself. But that's probably the reason why is that that I think young women need to see someone who a grown up who's doing it, but not doing it, who's doing what, the, you know, who's being the way they would like to be. That's how I felt about this, these women when I first heard them, um, their confidence, their fearlessness the unapologetic sense of self. And I think that it's important for women to know that even, even though young women to know that even though right now we're in a, in a situation, uh, whether you be Cardi B or, or Taylor Swift, you know, it's sort of like you're, you're, you're always going to be a decorative object. I mean, that's tends to be tends, you know, I think that is the inequity of it. It's like, if you compare the way men look in the business and women, it's just laughable, but uh, it's, it is that way that, that is, that is, um, um, th that's the truth of it all. However, it's not the only way. And that's important to remember. Confidence is sexy. That's what these women had. They weren't all great looking. They weren't all, you know, decorative at all. In fact, in many ways, they were not the norm. Most of them were not the norm in their looks. Maybe Peggy was the closest, Julie London, the only one that was beautiful. And then she suffered because of her beauty. That's the other weird thing. No one would take her seriously because of it. So there is this uh, sense that to me, confidence is as sexy as hell. And there are many ways to be powerful and sexy and really really special and charismatic on stage and as an artist and that isn't one way i am a believer in keeping it on you know i'm dressed in my man suit with my hair and my everything and my tie and the look that i love which is this cross-dressing um gender bending look which i've always had since i was a kid and i adore it it's the way i feel good and i think that i i tell young a lot you know these young women that 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 literally are writing to me all the time at my shows and coming up to me and asking me what what is the answer how do they get to that place you know what's she's extraordinary and my answer to them is just to not apologize for who you are for being different for being your unique self uh, to know that you're enough to not be a pleaser as in put the oxygen mask on, you know, put, put the mask on you for, put the oxygen on you first and to help the person next to you. You, you, our lives are not here to be pleasers. It's to be, to please us first there and then we can everyone else. I do believe in that strongly. And so I think that whatever way you look, whatever way you dress, whatever way, and this is what I hope the future is for women. Um, however you 
you present yourself, your music, your gift, your sexuality is on your own terms. Because when you're authentic and when your voice is true, people can tell. They know it. You know it. You know it as an audience member. And I think that's an exciting thing and thing and something that that women don't know. Most young women don't know. And I think it's like who your role models are, who you look up to, who you want to aspire to be, who what you think uh, the transaction is, you know. Uh, ultimately, it's really, it's really being your authentic self, your best self. And, and that's a hard one to say without going, yeah, well, how? Well, how is being true to yourself and not, not feeling like you're having to follow and do something because that's what expe is expected or, you know, I spent a whole career being told, why do you, why do you talk so much? Why do you, you know, why do you think you're funny? Why, why do you want to, you know, do this, do that, do that? It's like, you know what? And then you get to a point where it's like, look, this is who I am. Do you understand? This is who I am. You you like me or you don't like me, but I can't do anything about that. It's this is who I am. And the minute you reach that point, it's very hard to have when you're young. The minute you get that, and it's for men and women and everybody in between. This is the same thing for all of us. The minute you stop caring so much <laughs> and stop being the holy judge on yourself, because really it's not about how other people judge you. What matters is the voice inside you that's judging yourself. We all know that. But the minute you get to that point where you actually don't give a shit, really, that's the most freeing moment there is. Moving forward for women, I really hope that that is the future. All right. So let's talk about your future. If if <laughs> if 18 years ago you were lost and found, now you're at a point where you're saying, come and get it. Where's What do you feel is the, is the most authentic next step for Judith Owen? Right. That's the most unbelievably deep thing anybody has ever said to me as a question if you were lost and found now you'll come on and get it that is unbelievably insightful and I never even thought about it that way but yeah you're you've got it on the nose you've hit it I'm somebody who every single cd every single album I made you could tell where I was who I was how I was doing how my mental health was, how I was doing with it, with the black dog, how I was doing in my own personal, you know, struggles, because I, you know, and how I managed to beat this bastard and, you know, manage it, should I say, because you never beat it, you manage it. But lost and found, yeah, I was lost, I was found. And, but really when I say that, of course, it was, as we all are, we find, you know, it's, it's you that finds yourself. And here I am 18 years later after all this time and all these albums at a point where I'm saying to the world, grab this life, just embrace who you are for real right now. It's a short life. It's a short time we're here. Don't waste it. Don't waste it. I felt like I, you know, I haven't wasted anything. I've been on this journey. I hate to sound LA about it, but you know what I mean? But God, if I could have got here faster, I would have, but I couldn't because that's just the great, you know, hindsight is a bitter pill as I once wrote about myself. So here I am and looking forward, these women gave me permission to be my unapologetic self, to reveal the badass that was gestating all, all this time since I was six years old, I kid you not. And moving forward, I'm going to be performing and recording and being that person. This is, it's not going to be just about me, you know, shining my light upon the ladies, although that will always be a big part of who I am. And that's who I want to talk about. That's who I want the world to know right now and to honor and thank them. But for me moving forward, I'm living that. I will be that person from here on in. And I'm here to tell you and to tell every woman over 40, who, by the way, are my other giant audience, as well as my other giant gay audience, thank God, and everyone in between, thank God. But what I tell you, woman over 40, is, listen, you don't turn to dust, become irrelevant, invisible, and sexless when you pass a certain age. You just start to become the real you. And I mean that. I mean it. If only you let yourself 
you will and you do so I, that that's my that's my whole thing right now is uh this has been a crazy time you know for for everyone and for post me too i don't as a woman i don't want it just to be a label that came and went and that was just like oh well, we've done that now that's it it's it's sorted no it's not and what needs to be done is that women need to be talking about the women that went before we need to be sharing these stories we need to be supporting each other we need to be a true community um and that's what we need to do to change to shift to make a difference and, and so and I if think i may if yeah. i may you also need to create new material so you can become yes. one of one of those women that came before for future that's generations correct so what i go back to now or what i do next of course is i go I return to, and which is what I've been doing more and more uh, in the last show since you last saw me. You can't keep me away from the piano for long. It's where it's where I'm most alive. It's where I live. I'm I love being the front person. I love being that lady J up front and center. But when I'm at the piano, something special happens. It's who I am. So the return to to me at the piano, the return to my music, the return to my music with this spirit with this intention, with this clear, um, th this clear focus of what it is I do, who I am, and the fact that I, I no longer need permission to do anything or to please anybody. This is who I am. And thank God, this is why now I'm getting the, the love and respect and support and care that I that I've always yearned for isn't that the irony and that's what I tell people is like when you throw really show your true self you'll be amazed what happens you do show your true self but there is still a performance component of all of this and since we started with Peggy Lee I want to end with something else that Peggy Lee said she said I regard singing pretty much like acting each song is like playing a different role I get very involved with my material. I feel a responsibility for the emotion it brings out in the listener. Yeah. Do you equate singing with acting? And if so, how does that inform not just how you present yourself today, but how you're going to present yourself in a week or a year or a decade? Well, I agree with that uh, one thousand percent, if that's even possible. Um, I was trained as an actress, so that comes as no surprise, and a dancer and and somewhat the musician, but I can't read or write. That's, that's one of my um, dyslexic hangups. But in being so and having an overactive imagination, but having a core um, actor sensibility in, in, in me, I do believe that it is about you know, that being an interpreter is about being an actor. I mean, somebody like Sinatra was so extraordinary in that way. Peggy Lee was so magnificent in that way. You felt like she meant every single word. That's what I believe in. And it's half acting, half really exposing your true self. Because like any fine actor, you must immerse yourself in the character. You must immerse yourself in the role. And you must mean every word that you utter. And so you, if you're going to do it right and do it well, you take it to the place inside you where it resonates. You connect to that place. That's what I said about, you know, like when I was describing He's a Tramp. I sing it with infinite loss and a sense of reckless sadness because there's nothing I can do about it. I'm in love with someone who can never love me back. But I, I can't give it up because I'm addicted. And that's somewhere and something I know about. We've all been there. We all know that feeling. So I just, you know, I, I, I take it to that place and to that memory. And then I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present it to you, the audience, so that you believe every single word I'm saying. I'm not just singing this song because it's pretty or lovely or it sounds good or my voice is nice. That's not what it means to me. That's not what any of this means to me. I want you to be on this ride with me and to feel what I feel and remember how you've been there. That's exactly it. And that's what, that's transporting. And, it, and when I see someone do that on stage, 
to me that that is the greatest moment that that's 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 how I love to be entertained so yeah that, she, she could not be more right and I'm a big believer of this and again it's not uh it's it's not incredibly um popular I guess or you don't see that very much these days but I believe in it I do